Adjusted. Yeah. I know that's okay. I'll set it down for a minute here. Thank <laughs> you. 
And uh, first of all, from Casco Bay Lines, it's Paul Pottle, who's the director of our projects, Jonathan Graven, who's our director of our HR and finance, and Vic Mavadonis, who's the uh, operations manager, and uh, uh, Jessica Joyce is here to facilitate the meeting. She's not a Casco Bay Lines employee, and as a matter of fact, we just met three days ago. She was uh, very responsive to a, 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 a last minute request that it might be good to have someone controversial topics in that too. Um, so, so she's going to be facilitating the, facilitating the meeting. Sorry about that. Um, so one thing I just wanted to make sure for everyone that's clear, this is a, a public meeting and not a meeting of a Casco Bay Lines Board of Directors. And while there are several board members here, thank you for attending to listen, uh, they will not be doing board business here today in accordance with the law. The board members are here to listen. If a board member feels compelled to speak, they're speaking as individuals and not for the board. 
Um, <coughs> board members will have their opportunity to discuss this at the next board meeting, which is next Thursday, March 28th. So uh, on that note, I'll, I'm going to hand it over to Jessica. Can you introduce yourself? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I didn't have my note for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm Hank Berg, General Manager with Casco Bay Lines. I've been here uh, just about 10 years. Thank you. I'll be back on. I'm Jessica Joyce. I am uh, here. I have a business title bank consulting. I'm one of the stakeholders in this process. Why we're here as well as the agenda for today, and then I'll help facilitate the public comment period. Um, the first thing we wanted to know is that we know a lot of people came um, right around 10 and weren't able to sign in, so if you didn't get a chance to sign in on your way in, please try to do so on the way out so we can have a record of that. The meeting will be recorded today, an audio recording, and a transcript of that recording will be forwarded to the Board of Directors. Sure, we can do that. Thank you. Uh, we also have some students here from the Stahl Institute that are doing a video recording for a short two to five minute documentary video around change. If you don't want to be filmed, please speak to some of the students. And I'm just going to ask them to raise their hands right now so you know who they are. Thank you. All right. We do have a hard stop at 12.30, and I'm aware of an earlier ferry around 11.15, so we'll try to have folks who are on that earlier ferry have enough time to comment. And I will mention a few times that we do have paper feedback forms if you'd prefer to submit your comments in writing rather than verbally. So first, I'm actually going to flip forward to why we're here and then I'll go through the agenda. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is to provide information on the Casco Bay Island Transit District um, background. So Hank is going to give us a presentation to provide information on the schedule fleet analysis process, to provide status of the new vessel, and to solicit input on capacity of the new vessel for the board's consideration, and then discuss next steps. What we hope to accomplish in this meeting, we have three outcomes, is a shared understanding of the overall process to date and next steps, a record of feedback from the public on capacity of the new vessel, and a shared understanding of future opportunities to remain engaged and gather information from the public. The scope of this meeting is uh, fairly narrow, and I'm gonna go through what uh, we try to narrow down to maximize the time for today. So the scope of the meeting does include a process for development of the new vessel service to peaks, discussions around the capacity, both passenger, vehicle, and freight of the new vessel. And what it does not include are Casco Bay line projects or initiatives that have been or would need to be considered separately by the board of directors. For example, priority boarding or reservations and a number of other issues. Or anything that would fall outside of the purview of the Casco Bay Island Transit District. Um, so first I'm gonna go back here to the agenda. We already have, uh, we're a few minutes behind, but I think we'll be able to catch up. After we have this welcome and agenda overview, we'll have about a 20 minute presentation that will provide all that information we just talked about. And then we'll start the public comment period at 10.30. Because of the number of folks in the room, we're gonna start off with a three minute period for each person who would like to comment. And I'll go through instructions for that when we get to that point in the agenda, but we will ask folks to line up at the microphone to provide that. And if we have more time after the first round of comments, we'll invite people back up after. There'll also be an opportunity to ask questions during that period that will be answered later. And that's the 12.15, is that if you do have questions on the presentation or anything else within the scope of this meeting, you can ask them during your comments. They'll be recorded by the Casco Bay Line staff and responded to a little bit later, or I'll also discuss some of them will be addressed on the website if we run out of time. And then we'll wrap up at 12.30. We do have a hard stop. There is a 12.45 ferry 
So the last thing that I want to mention is that we have a few guidelines just to help keep us on track today. And we do ask that you be recognized before speaking by either forming a line at the microphone or raising your hand to get the attention uh, from myself or any of the speakers. And for the record, because this is being sent to the board, we ask that you state your name and affiliation, if you have any, before making a comment. And I'll remind you again of that before the session. Please treat everyone with respect, uh, express your opinions responsibly, focusing on the issues and not personal differences or individuals, and speak honestly and kindly. Please also refrain from clapping or verbally showing support or dissent from each other's comments. Allow others to be heard. We recognize that we all interrupt at times by mistake or build on each other's statements. However, we strive to allow each person to finish his or her thoughts. Engage in each other's thoughts, ideas, and opinions. We recognize the value of a meeting where everyone has the chance to participate. Keep an open mind, especially on opinions that may differ from your own. And stay focused on the topic under discussion. Um, We'll try to stay focused on the scope that you all have on your agenda. Um, if you all will take the moment now to silence your cell phones, appreciate that, and avoid any side conversations. And finally, we have a shared responsibility for success today and uh, achieving those outcomes that are laid out. Uh, two housekeeping items before I pass it on to Hank. There are um, two exits, as you can see, or maybe three, actually, two in the back of the room and one um, that you came in, and there's a bathroom right in the hallway. And uh, with that, I think I'm going to pass it over to Hank. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, I, I thought it would be uh, important to take a few minutes to um, share a little bit about our history, because a lot of people now are governed. Uh, and some uh, statistics on how things are going and trends. I'm going to try to, I'll probably go through this pretty fast because the uh, time is kind of uh, precious right now, but this will be posted on the website uh, after this meeting. So, uh, a little bit of history. Um, try to start it off that the, the history of Casco Bay Lines goes back over 150 years. And a little uh, interesting fact came across is that in ni around 1900, the, uh, the, the coal-fired steamer called the Pilgrim, around, around 1900, could carry, was allowed to carry 800 passengers down bay and 1,100 passengers to peaks. We're not going to do that. Uh, then, then along, <laughs> way before my time, uh, there, uh, sort of a historical look at some of the peaks fairies. There was the Namada. I'm not exactly sure what time frame. Dan, do you know? Looks like she had the capacity of three. Okay. Then there was the Berkeley around the 1960s. Then there was the Rebel, which starts to get when the Casco Bay Transit District was formed. So she was built in 1957 came into Casco Bay Lines around 1970s, could carry 72 to 174 passengers and up to nine uh, vehicles, 65 foot length, 34 foot beam. And of course, the Mashagon that we have now, she was built in 1987, uh, in service since 88. And when she was originally put into service, uh, the passenger capacity was 349 passengers. And later on, uh, the board and the Coast Guard agreed to um, raise that to 399 passengers. Her length is 122 feet and beams 37 feet. So a little bit of the, of the, uh, the sort of the business history. Uh, what, throughout that 150 years, the um, economics of many private entities operating profitably only in the summer uh, just did not work. And many bankruptcies occurred and there was the constant threat of not having year-round service to the islands. And that's what uh, prompted the, uh, the generation of the Casco Bay Island Transit District when the, Casco Bay, the then private Casco Bay Lines declared bankruptcy in 1981. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in 1981, emergency state legislation uh, took place, was enacted, and it was done to ensure the continuation of the service of the islands uh, of Casco Bay. And the way they did that was to give Casco Bay Island Transit District 
the exclusive right to transport passengers, vehicles, and uh, freight to the six regulated islands in Casco Bay. Cas Casco Bay the Transit District took, then took over the assets of Casco Bay Lines on March 26, 1982, which is almost exactly 37 years ago. So the current law just states, uh, among other things, that the district is for public purposes in the interest of public health, safety, comfort, and convenience of the inhabitants of the islands comprising the district and other passengers served by the district. We cannot segregate or discriminate between passengers and all are to be treated equally. We're governed by a board of directors, 12 members, 10 are elected from the islands for a term of three years. One's appointed by the city of Portland and one's appointed by the commissioner of the main department of transportation. And the responsibility of the board is for making policy, not for implementing policy. And they are my employer and supervisor. And there are other duties that are set forth by the bylaws. We have lots of masters. Uh, the Federal Transit Administration, which is a federal agency under the, main, uh, under the uh, Department of Transportation. We are uh, regulated by the Maine Public Utilities Commission. We have involvement with the Maine Department of Transportation. We're over, overseen by the United States Coast Guard and the Department of Homeland Security. So we have to answer to a lot of people and agencies. I want to change the, the, the uh, topic a little bit and go into some trends that have been happening since, uh, oops. Uh, this is the Peaks Island annual ridership and it goes back from uh, 2004 to current 2018. And if you look back at over, that same, over that whole period, you can see the blue line trend. And so the growth over those years has been a little under 2%. If you look back to 2010 and look at that growth, growth has been about 3.7%. And if you look back for the last five years, the growth is, is about 4%. So there's, uh, except for that little dip in 2010, which is probably a result of the recession of 2008, 2009, the trend has been continually growing. This is a chart of the uh, Peaks Island vehicles annually. The same, looking at a trend from uh, 2004, it's offset by one year, I apologize for that. Year below it, but it's we look back to 2004, and that growth back then is uh, about 3.4 percent. Then looking back at 2010, the growth since then is, is uh, about 7 percent. But looking back at the last five years, the growth has been uh, just around 12 percent. So the vehicle is also exhibiting growth. The freight we have to look at freight by revenue. We don't have specific counts of pieces of freight. Uh, we estimate that we annually, for the whole operation, carry about 500,000 pieces of freight. On the, and the growth since 2010, two peaks, from the revenue perspective, has been about 7%. And if you notice that big spike in last year, we don't have a good explanation for it. We suspect some of it is probably contributed by a little company called Amazon. The, the financial performance, this is a snapshot of our fiscal year 2018, which ended at the end of September in 2018. And as you can see on the right-hand side, there are, this is, those are the three or four summer months where Casco Bay Lines makes a profit. We operate in the black. And that's very, very important because if you look at the other months, we are operating in the red. So everything that happens during the summer has to carry us over through the rest of the year and, uh, and allow for any uh, investments in any capital improvements. So we always hope for a, a sunny summer. So now to talk a little bit more specifically why we're here, and that's the new vessel project. A little bit of history of that. Uh, back in 2015 and 2016, the board of directors went uh, on some uh, strategic planning retreats. And with the, the intent of that was to, we had a lot of things going on, a lot of things that wanted to be done, was to talk about them, prioritize them, and give the staff direction on which way to go and to pursue funding. And so out of that, uh, there was included a um, looking at schedule and a fleet analysis. Is our composition of our fleet correct? And looking at the schedule, which hasn't been uh, really looked at as a whole for 
very, very, very long time. Any change has always been done one change at a time. It's never been really looked at in terms of efficiencies. Uh, and then also to uh, develop a vessel replacement schedule because two of our boat, boats in the fleet were, one was actually coming at that time, coming at the end of useful life, and the other one um, is, was getting near to it. And then uh, with that, uh, staff was directed to go out and find funding to be able to do these things. Along with that, guidelines were created for these projects to give staff some uh, direction as we, as we proceeded. And sort of later in the game, or more recently, the Federal Transit Administration, one of those masters of ours, uh, set a requirement that we have to, all and transit agencies that receive federal money have to create a transit asset management plan. And that's kind of a fancy way of saying we have to look at all our assets, vessels, uh, anything other, anything that we use that's critical to the operation, determine what its uh, useful life is, and uh, determine and set some goals in terms of what the district will allow for uh, any asset that any asset that might be at the end of its life, and then to use that sort of as a roadmap to create a capital improvement plan and to be able to go to the federal transit agency to, to see if there was funding available. We had already had a long-term capital improvement program, so we took that and put together this transit asset management plan, and it's now. Uh, it's been documented and it's, it's, it, it's in the record. I, and out of that plan and out of the for strategic planning, um, the, the <coughs> Mashagon was identified as the first vessel to be replaced because she was at the end of the year, end of life. She's 31 or 32 years old now. And the cost of maintenance on her is getting to be cost prohibitive. She's still safe, but every time we put her in the dry dock, it's getting to be very, very costly. And then, Followed by that, the McCoy is approaching the end of uh, useful life. So we need money to do this. And um, so with the help of the FTA, Federal Transit Administration, the state of Maine, the city of Portland, and the Portland Area Comprehensive uh, Transportation System, and, and uh, Casco Bay Lines, we were able to secure $11.2 million to do the design and construction of the, a new car ferry for Phoenix. <coughs> And the kind of exciting part of that is we tried, we looked at all the ab different avenues and we were successful in winning a $6 million competitive grant that uh, was nationwide, that only had $30 million available and we were awarded the largest uh, grant for that particular competitive grant. So, and we had the support um, of Senator Collins and Senator King. So the program is fully funded. So, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the process um, in terms of, it started out as a combined look at the schedule and the fleet. Uh, and then I'll show you later, it got down to where we're actually doing the new vessel uh, for Peaks. So at the very beginning, we did a, 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 a request for proposals and we looked at all submittals and we picked a, a firm called KPFM, which is a marine transportation consultant firm to come in and help us uh, consult for staff and ultimately to provide a recommendation to the board. This is a, 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 one of three charts of what I tried to show is a very complicated process <coughs> and try to break it down uh, so that it's, the major items are uh, identified. So at the very beginning was the board strategic planning. Then uh, on the top a part of the chart is sort of the public uh, outreach part and the very first one is called the POP notice. That's a program of projects notice, where if any grant is gonna get approved and funded by the Federal Transit Administration, it needs to be go through a public process. And we use the, um, the local uh, Metropolitan Planning Office, which is the PACS, the, uh, the Portland Area Comprehensive Transportation System. Uh, we use their process to publicize that. And they put it out um, for so many days, I don't remember exactly how, they get any public comment, and that's uh, shared with the Federal Transit Administration as they review the grant, decide whether to approve it. <clears throat> they did approve it. Uh, at that time, I don't think there were any comments. Uh, and then we went out with the RFP, picked a na naval consultant, which is KPFF. They did a, a public survey out in the August, September time frame. They also did uh, existing conditions report regulatory review, 
climate and demand analysis. We had uh, a meeting at the terminal in August of 2017, and then we went out to each island in, 20, in September of 2017. The consultants uh, have gathered all this data, put everything together, and came to the board in May of 2018 with their recommendations in terms of the fleet composition the, um, and which vessels to replace. And the board at that time uh, approved to go ahead and start uh, creating a new schedule for the Down Bay and Peaks and to go pursue a new ferry for Peaks. So the new Peaks Ferry design status, um, we released an RFP, uh, again, a competitive request for proposals, and selected a designer, Elliott Bay Design Group from Seattle, Washington. Uh, they are working, uh, they're developing a proposed new vessel configuration that meets our needs for the next 30 years. So this new vessel is going to be in place for 30, maybe 40 years, depending on how soon we can get funding at that time. I probably won't be around. Um, and, and that it needs to conform to the various regulatory requirements and operational constraints. So where we are in that process is that they are only about 20% into the preliminary design. So it's still very early on in the design stage. And that part of the process looks even more complicated because it is. Um, so on the left hand of the dashed line is the result of what happened in the previous phase. And so now, because it was a new grant, we had to uh, go out with another uh, pro program of project notice, did that. Uh, I don't believe we received any comments on that. And it was submitted to the Federal Transit Administration and they approved the grant. We went out with an RFP, selected LA, LA Bay Design Group. Uh, also in parallel with that, the, uh, the, according to the board strategic plan guidance, we created a vessel advisory committee, which I'll talk about just a bit on the next slide. We kicked off the project. There was a public meeting held at the terminal in May of 2018. And again, we went out to each island in uh, June of 2018. Uh, the Vessel Advisory Committee met a couple times during that process, and all that information plus the consultant recommendation fit into the preliminary design box. And that solid black line, if you're looking at this uh, display, is where we are today. So we're, we're, the Orange Public Meeting was not actually planned originally, um, but there was a lot of discussion about the company more. And, um, and then the board will uh, address that at their next meeting. So, Again, we're very early in the preliminary design phase. Once the preliminary design is done, we expect to go back out, we expect to come to Peaks again for feedback on the design and to go to the Vessel Advisory Committee again and then to go to the board. But one thing I wanted to point out is that when the board takes this under consideration, there are many things that the board will need to look at. One is public feedback, <coughs> public comments. The other is main law, the Federal Transit Administration requirements. Coast Guard requirements, main dot requirements, Casco Bayline staff input, the demand considerations, financial considerations, technology and legal advice. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into this decision. The Vessel Advisory Committee was created by the board to act as, just as it says, an advisory to the, to the design process. And the composition was set at that uh, strategic planning meeting and includes members of the public, Casco Bay Line staff, and directors from the, the committee was appointed by the board president, as is all committee members uh, on, from the board, and it serves as an advisory board. All meetings are posted and open to the public, and the committee has, really has no authority to create or approve policy or make any final decisions. It's purely okay, um, so for public input, is that five minutes, the 15 or the 20 I originally had? Um, so we, we take the public input policy, uh, public input very seriously, and um, as I said before, we rely on PACs for the program of projects. Um, we, we we gather input from those different public meetings, um, and we make every effort to try to um, piece of guidance. Is please don't assume that if you have any discussion with the marine crew or the shoreside crew, that that discussion will be included as part of the process. It's just not um, part part of our process. Uh, this, what we plan to do is we're going to share with the board all the feedback we received on the new vessel. And as I said, this is just one of many inputs to the board. 
So the next step is on March 28th, the board will consider guidance to the staff on vessel capacity. And we were right now in the design process, things that are being considered are the hull design, which could be a double-ended or a single-ended. The Mashagon right now is a single-ended, so it has to turn around at one end, has to back out, whereas a double-ended would just go back and forth. Uh, it would have propellers at both ends, which would save time. We're also looking, this is pretty exciting, we're looking at uh, an alternative propulsion system, a hybrid diesel electric system. We've still got a lot of work, work to do on that, but th that technology is getting more mature and we're feeling more comfortable with it, but a lot, lot more to do. And then we're gonna complete the preliminary design. We'll c conduct another public meeting and um, looking for any uh, people with interest, and I suspect there probably will be a few. Uh, we'll take the proposed design to the board and get their uh, guidance from that. And if all goes well, we hope for the vessel to be in operation in 2021. Because we'll so the construction, uh, which hasn't started yet, the design would be cleaned up. Uh, plans and specs would be done, cost estimates would go for an RFP, a request for proposal for the shipyard selection. We'd have another <coughs> program of projects notice, construction, delivery, and deployment, and the decision would be made on the disposition of the Mashagon. No decision has been made on that yet. And the new vessel decision will be in place in this district for the next 30 or 40 years. So it's a very, very important decision. And I suspect that's why you were all here. Um, some interesting um, observations that most of you may, might not be aware of is that restricting capacity on the new vessel won't restrict capacity to peaks, passenger capacity to peaks. It won't stop the buildup of people coming over during the day. The phenomenon we're seeing is the boats are bringing people on every trip over here during the day, and then everyone wants to leave in the afternoon. So we, go, we reach capacity more on the island side than we do on the Portland side. So even if we were stick to pass, that buildup would still happen. And perhaps arguably more important is that we're regulated with the Public Utilities Commission. And if we don't satisfy the demand, private operators can come in and petition the Public Utilities Commission to provide passenger service to the islands. And while that may sound good, what happens is what happened back before we became a transit district. And private and operators will come in and take the revenue during the summer and then leave during the winter. And we're left with not any revenue to carry us over in the winter. So uh, the, the repercussions of that could be um, quite, uh, quite negative. And then, but there are other things that can happen in that if, if there is a global reason that there should be limitation to the island that everyone will adhere to, then the board can do some things like still build a higher capacity vessel for the next 30 or 40 years, but could restrict capacity by policy. But it would have to be a global, it's not just Casco Bay Lines. It would have to be that if it, everyone, if, it, if a private operator got in, that they too would be limited to this capacity. So I just wanted to share some of those observations with you. Again, this whole information pack will be on the board, and I hope, I hope it was helpful. Okay, I'm going to walk us through the public comment period, but before I do that, can I just have a quick show of hands of who thinks you might comment today verbally? Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. All right, so I'm just gonna reiterate a few things and then I'll read the guiding question that we have. And the first thing I'd like to say uh, is just to remember to state your name and if you have an affiliation, even if that's just that you're a resident, <coughs> for the record, that would be helpful before you give your comment. Uh, to reiterate again, your comments are for the board of directors and they will be transcribed from an audio recording to be given to them prior to their meeting next week. <coughs> All comments will be part of this transcript sent to the board. However, we do prefer that any comments or questions outside of the scope that we talked about and that you all have on your agenda um, are submitted in writing using the comment form. And if you didn't get one on the way in, 
Um, I believe there should still be plenty on the table. So I'm going to go through. What we're going to do is if you'd like to comment, I'm going to ask, and don't stand up yet, but um, I'll let you know when to form a line behind the microphone. And it was brought to my attention that for the folks leaving on the 11 15 ferry that we're going to invite you up first so you get a chance to comment before people leaving on the later ferry. You will have three minutes to provide verbal comment on the specific question post or another question within the scope of this meeting. This time may also be used to ask clarifying questions on the presentation, some of which the Casco Bay Line staff we have here will respond to in a 15 minute session after the public comment period. I will be using my phone to keep time and a sound will and a chime will sound when you're done with your time. I'm also going to stand up when you have one minute left and then I'll come to the mic and ask you to take your seat at that three minutes and that's just in fairness so everyone gets a chance to, to comment today. Um, if you have more to say than your allotted time, time permitting we will allow a second round of comments, but after we've gotten through everyone who wants to comment first, and you also may submit additional comments in writing if you run out of time. Um, if you know someone who couldn't make it today, but would still like to submit comments, you can either grab some extra forms, or there are instructions on that form to submit them by uh, email. <coughs> Any emails or letters received by the end of the day today, and by that I mean you know, 11.59 p.m. will be included in the board package. Comments received by mail, email, or letter after that will be considered by the board and addressed at a later time. And also, any questions that are asked that the staff uh, don't have time to respond to will be posted on their website um, within a reasonable time frame. So, with that information, I'm going to pose the question, and then after that, um, ask anyone who would like to comment who's on the earlier ferry to come form a line. And if the line is too long, I know it's a, it's a busy uh, space here, and we can just allow that line to uh, trickle down a little bit before getting up. Okay, so the question, and again, this is a guiding question um, to solicit comments on the scope that we're here for today. So it's given the information presented today. Do you oppose or support the consideration of a proposed vessel design for a new Peaks Island ferry that has increased capacity? And we ask that you provide justification for your answer either way. Okay, so with that, if you'd like to comment, the microphone is there. If you need to adjust the height, please just, you can, ratchet up or down. <coughs> Concern is 
we're going to build a boat that will uh, take care of people for uh, 100 days. And the question is, that boat in February and in December and in January will be a lot more expensive to run than the current boat. It isn't going to have the uh, additional capacity. I mean, it'll have the additional capacity. It will have the additional expense as well. And my concern is that whatever new revenue that we get in the summertime uh, will be more than offset by the revenue that we don't get in the wintertime. Also, basing, basing it on uh, uh, perpetual growth, uh, as your own graph said uh, during the recession, uh, there were two, two years where uh, the revenue was way down. Um, I think that we can take a look and expect that uh, that will happen again, and over 30 years that will probably happen uh, maybe half a dozen times, where we have two or maybe three year periods where ridership is down for whatever reason. Um, so building that much larger a vessel uh, may put ourselves in actually, uh, it may be great for the short term uh, for part of the year and may be a real uh, problem for the rest of the year. Thank you. So I, with my understanding of the demand and uh, of the consequences, 30 years of, you know, or more of, of our next, uh, you know, boat investment decision, I'm not convinced that a larger capacity boat is uh, is the only way to go, or even the, the optimal or best way to go. Uh, a couple of a couple of reasons why I guess I'm, I'm, we've seen a recent uptick in demand, but. As you've already mentioned in, in, the, in the kind of setup to this conversation, there are many, you know, reasons why we might have increased or decreased demand. You mentioned the weather, daily fluctuations like that. There might be longer term fluctuations, what attractions are available on the island. You know, currently we have golf cart rentals on the island. I'm sure that's contributed to it, Reggae Sunday. But uh, other islands may compete for attention in the future. We may just have a slump in the economy in the future that would depress tourism. Currently we have a bunch of cruise ships coming in, I'm sure it's pumping all up, but there's no guarantee that a three year, seven year trend uh, in increased ridership will continue. And I do think, I actually disagree with the comment earlier that wait times won't have an impact on what uh, demand is to visit Pete's Island. I think, you know, Tourists who are coming in looking for a quick sort of idea may be, you know, uh, sort of dissuaded by a longer wait time. Uh, other other impacts to demand that I could foresee would be wait times, fare prices, the length of time required for a round trip. It's quicker to visit peaks than other islands. There's other tourist options and marketing. So you know, there's there's random effects. There's effects that you have control of as Castle Bay Lines. I know I have been in the ferry terminal and I have overheard on more than one occasion uh, employees of Castle Bay Lines uh, sort of redirecting people who have interest in some of the more touristy runs like the mail mailboat run and saying, we think you should consider peaks. It's a quicker thing. You can get out, you can walk around, that sort of stuff. So I know you have levers that you can <laughs> direct demand in certain directions or perhaps even create alternatives, more tourist runs, things like that that would have an impact on de redirecting demand away from uh, Peaks Island ridership, which is kind of maxing out. So the concerns I would have are, the argument that you're sort of making to us is we should better accommodate increased travel to the island, which I think many of us would have hesitations about in order to have a larger boat that we must sustain year round for 30 plus years, that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me when there are other pathways of addressing both demand, uh, affecting it, and um, 
and accommodate one another. Thank you. I'm short. Uh, I'm Karen Chess. I'm a resident of the island. Um, and I'm opposed to the boat. And one of the reasons I'm opposed is that I feel like there has not been sufficient planning and determining the capacity of the vessel. Um, islands around the world are grappling with the same problems that we are. That is, an influx of visitors at a peak time and demand um, being over capacity. And therefore, the good news is that there's a fair amount of writing about how to deal with this issue. And best practices go beyond looking at the size of the boat. Best practices see capacity of boats as one question among many that need to be addressed. And the fundamental flaw, at least as discussed in, in the case studies, and in the best practices that are recommended, is you do not start looking at capacity. You ask a larger question, which is, um, how do we deal with capacity? Spread out demand and prioritize walk-on and bicycle cu customers. Mm -hmm. That is, if you <coughs> merely look at capacity of the vessel and without looking at other options, you're making a mistake according to, I could go on, but there's also a National Academy report, there's a European study, and no doubt more than that. So there's a fundamental flaw of asking what size boat do we need without looking at how to deal with demand. What we did not hear in your remarks today, in your list of the masters, the many masters you must answer to, is the inclusion of the people of the islands in that list of masters. We did not hear from you that there is ins <laughs> we did not hear from you that there is insufficient revenue with current capacity to make the bay lines work. You showed us that you need revenue in the summer. We're not we're not in in a problem right now with the capacity we have. What we did not hear from you is that there has been any process that looked at anything other than what kind of boat do we need and how many people to, do we need on that boat to make a certain amount of money to make a certain equation work? There's been no talk at any point, and it's what's gotten everyone so riled up, so apparently late in the game, but early in the game for us because we did not know. There has been no broad questioning of how does this fit into the whole system?
Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Stuart Jackson. I'm a resident here on Peace Island year round. I'm also a business owner out here. And just wanted to speak, thank you guys very much, uh, by the way, for coming out here today. Um, I just want to speak to, I actually am in support of the new vote. Um, based on the, the trends that we've seen, I've seen personally, whatever, over the last seven years, working down front, we have more people, we have more cars, um, and sometimes even uh, my freight and stuff gets held up on the other side. Showing the sun um, for comments as well, just in fairness to that person commenting. Um, and also, I just wanted to make a quick note that it's a few minutes before 11 for those of you who are taking the earlier ferry. Hopefully, you've had a time uh, to comment, and we invite um, anyone else else, obviously, at this point to comment as well. Go ahead, thank you. Hi, I'm Betsy Remich Healy. I am a year round Peaks resident. Thank you all for coming and setting this up. And I also want to thank people like Lisa and Steve and Randy and all the people that probably helped make this happen. Um, so I just wanted to share with you the epiphany I had in the shower this morning. <laughs> Uh, which is, you know, the passenger capacity issue is a two-month problem that you're proposing a 12-month solution for. And with that comes, as has been mentioned earlier, the uh, ongoing carrying costs of that, and we know who will bear those. And I would just urge you to look at this problem differently and say, what are the creative ways we can address the two-month capacity, pa passenger capacity problem over those two months. And, you know, for, of course putting on additional boats, I mean, you know what to expect based on recent history, um, possibly charging everybody a little more for those extra boats. I don't know, as long as it's everybody, um, that might be a possibility. Anyway, I'm sure there are ways to do it, but please don't burden us year-rounders with bearing the cost of a capacity problem over 12 months that only exists basically two months. That's for passengers. Now, for vehicles, I have noticed that there's um, additional lines all year round for getting on cars and trucks on the ferry. So I'm thinking, is there a way to not increase the passenger capacity but to increase um, the vehicle capacity by a couple because I think we do see that demand and your data for, bore that out that the, the, the vehicle traffic has gone up way more than the passenger traffic and that does seem to persist for whatever reasons year round. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Doug Wilbur. I live here on Peaks Island. I also own a business, so I'm here on the island most every day of the year. And I am opposed to the idea of an increased capacity vessel. Uh, my, reason, my reasons are three. First of all, I echo the financial concerns about the increased need for capacity only in the summer months being the generator of revenue. Um, although a larger boat would address this increased capacity, it would also have much higher operating costs throughout the entire year. Those higher operating costs probably will not be addressed by the rider ship during those months. Those costs will continue to increase 
over time, over the next 30 years. Fuel prices are not going to go down, so operating costs will increase. Secondly, though we do need a new ferry, um, the problem that the Mashagon has now is that it cannot keep up with capacity on the existing schedule. The, it, during the peak months of June, July, and August, the Mashagon runs later and later and later during the day, especially on the weekends. And to address that, Casco Bay Lines, I think wisely, has begun running second and more, quote, more boats as needed to fill, us, fill in. If a bigger boat were built with bigger capacity, I don't see how it would keep up with the current schedule. You'd have to run fewer trips. With fewer trips, you carry fewer people and fewer cars, therefore negating the benefit of a larger boat. The current crew struggles to keep up with cars, freight, and passengers when we're in those peak months, and it cannot keep up with the current schedule. It seems to me that the logical solution would be to build not only a new car ferry of the existing capacity, but also possibly a second smaller boat that can be used to fill in to carry passengers during, during the peak months. And last of all, I want to talk about the quality of life here on Peaks Island for the residents. We've seen a tremendous increase in traffic, in crowds, in conflicts, in accidents, and this is not just a suburb of Portland. This is a community, this is a small town, and the quality of life for us has been negatively impacted by the numbers of people and cars that have come out here. That should be a very strong consideration. Thank you. I'm Arthur Fink. I've been a resident full-time on the island for roughly 20 years. We were asked to stay focused on the issues that the Casco Bay Lines and its board can address, and not to talk about other things like bathrooms or benches or trail capacity. So I'll be a good boy, and I won't address those. But what I do want to say is I'm very concerned that they are not being addressed and they're not being addressed in synchrony with the decision to set vessel capacity. Actions have consequences. If we were a small town about to get a sewer system, some of us would be saying, oh my gracious, do we have enough seats in the school? Do we have a big enough police department, fire department, firehouse? All those infrastructure issues because as the sewer system allows more building development, the population will likely increase. And there's a corresponding set of issues as we have more capacity to bring people to and from the island, are we going to tax the infrastructure? I can appreciate that the Casco Bay Lines and its board has not addressed that issue. But if they don't, who will? And how can we be sure that that will be addressed and considered as we set the capacity? In the absence of such consideration, I'm at this point in time not comfortable supporting a, a, a vessel with larger passenger and vehicle capacity. Thank you very much. Arthur just said a lot of what I was going to say. So, um, but the the biggest concern I hear from many many residents is we can't handle 400 an hour in the summer. The trash is overflowing. The and this is why I'm opposed. Um, I realize that's not something you have control over, but um, we don't have bathroom capacity. And a particular concern to many people is we don't have enough constructive uh, things in alignment with. Peaks Island culture to do. Um, there's more than one mainland person that has told me, I was hoping to come over and have a quiet time, but it has degenerated into a drinking scene. Those were her, that was one person's exact words. So um, I also would like to um, disagree that demand is independent of supply. 
I do think that um, increased ease of coming over will probably, if, several people have said to me, if, we, if they build it, uh, they will come. Um, and if they, if they come, we, I, I'm also a Peaks Island Council member, by the way, I also have grandchildren on the island. If they're gonna, even with 400 people, if we need some help, Belinda, um, to handling these people uh, in infrastructure and, and parking, and also Welsh Street, everyone knows is a nightmare in the summer. Um, and so if we're struggling now with 400, um, I think we'll really be struggling with 600. See your name for the record? I'm sorry, Andrea Rosenberg. There Hello, um, my name is Chuck Radis, and I'm a year-round resident here on Peaks. Um, I was on the board of the Casco Bay Lines uh, a number of years ago, and uh, it's a tough job being a board member. Uh, uh, it's a volunteer job, and ultimately we're going to be having uh, a vote uh, later on in which the decision about this vote will be made primarily by board members, by a majority of them, who are down the bay. Uh, while it's important, as I feel, because I'm not for the expanded uh, passenger with the new boat, uh, I think it's very important for people here to uh, consider strongly about uh, contacting the other board members down the bay. Uh, their webmail addresses can be found on the Castle Bay uh, website. And uh, I would urge you, if you do want to weigh in on this to other board members and, and try to influence how this vote eventually will go, uh, that you're polite. Uh, remember, there are volunteers. These, uh, I went through the period of time when gas prices increased like crazy back in 2006. It was not a pleasant time to be a board member when prices <laughs> went way up. And so uh, I just wanted to not repeat a lot of the social issues, which I, I, I truly believe are very important here and aren't being considered. But uh, I, I would like to bring other, make other people aware about other board members that need to be aware of this conversation here because it could happen to their island. You know, right now I think they're insulated from a lot of this by right? not having that many uh, trips per day, but you can imagine well, how Cliff Island would feel if they had uh, full boats going out 8, 10, 12 times a day to their island. So I think we would make that analogy. Thank you. Zach Barrow. <coughs> Start, Zach Barrett, uh, Peaks Island, part-time resident since 1976, and Portland resident since uh, for about 15 years. I'd like to speak in opposition to this vote, particularly um, in regard to increased uh, vehicle capacity. I um, was a little disappointed by the level of analysis um, that um, should, seems very narrow in, in, in scope in terms of um, be, be, being profitable without any consider of externalities. Uh, things have been mentioned, uh, various efficiencies that can be made, line management, vehicle reservations, traffic command management plans. Uh, and then there's also the um, issue of who their master is of, of, uh, of Casco Bay Lines is, the um, P Public Utilities Commission and the Department of Transportation. These, these are public utilities. Uh, so that we're not looking at uh, uh, all, all types of transportation are, are subsidized. Uh, highways are subsidized. So that to, to look at it, the Casper Bay Lines is a single um, for-profit entity uh, without uh, considering the greater Portland and, and the state and, and, and larger is um, seems to be in um, opposition to your mission as a public transit district. Thank you. <coughs> well, my name is Steve Anderson. I am a full-time resident here on the island. I'm also a member of the Peace Island Council, but I'm speaking on behalf of myself. So Hank, you've said a couple of things repeatedly. You've said there's no clear consensus on whether islanders want a larger boat, and you've said that the decision is not made regarding size. So there appears to be a little bit of a disconnect between what you're saying and what we're seeing from the Casco Bay Lines. As an example, the only designs that have moved forward to the point of engineering were for a much larger boat, a boat of 600 passengers and 18 vehicles. 
So the decision to move to design stage for engineering review seems to be made in a vacuum. I'd like to share some data on the data person. Here, KPFF Consulting Engineers, the survey that you did, you asked the question, my goal for services as it relates to passengers is to move more, less, or no opinion passengers. Of the 283 people that responded, 38 said they wanted to move more passengers. 54% said they wanted to move the same number of passengers. That data was in 2017. The, the choice to make to send designs out for a larger boat were made after that, after that data point. So it seems like that may have been ignored or not seen. The Peak Island Council did its own survey. We just uh, published that survey a couple of days ago. As of this morning, 550 people have viewed the survey results. 399 people, ironically, the, the exact <laughs> capacity of the Mashagolan, completed the survey. I don't think there's correlation between those two. Of those 399, actually 395 that we have the data in for, 30% wanted a larger boat and 65% wanted the same size boat for passengers. Very consistent with the data collection that KPFF concluded. Third data point. It's also a very strong message in the data that infrastructure meets importance of concern. 75% of people felt the infrastructure on Portland was of concern. I think phase two of the work we did will really help mitigate some of that. 79% had concerns over Peaks Island. So I'm very pleased with the work that the city council is starting to think about doing on Peaks and looking for solutions. I share these because I believe that you, the board of directors, should really care. Your mission statement, I downloaded this morning, says our mission is to provide sufficient, dependable, reliable service in a safe and secure manner as affordably as possible so as to preserve our year-round island communities. Mm -hmm. The people here today, the data we've made available to you, are the voice of this year-round island community. This is about a boat that serves just this community. In my mind, ignoring these voices above this boat is an abdication of responsibility as a board and a violation of your mission. Hi, I'm Margaret Kelsey, and I am a taxpayer resident of Peaks Island. Here we are again <laughs> before you. I appreciate everything that you've brought to us. I know it takes a great amount of time to aggregate this data. Um, in concert with what one of my fellow residents, Carol, said, a big piece of data that was missing for us is exactly where do we stand financially? Where do you stand? We don't know the numbers around how much you're making every summer to support and keep us in the black. I work for an organization where we recognize what brings people together is shared values and shared vision. And I think we all would like to feel that we're tired of this sense of being in an opposition to what Casco Bay Lines is trying to do. We recognize the challenge that you have, or I certainly do, in having to meet the increasing demand. But supply and demand as your primary argument doesn't satisfy my reason to support this, and so I don't. I don't support this for two reasons. Primarily the process that you are just now entertaining public comment is insulting. And just having a bigger boat for all the reasons everybody else has already said doesn't satisfy the rationale. I agree with the people who run businesses on this island. They need a different solution to support their commercial business. You have three primary target audiences to serve, commercial businesses, residents, and tourists. And to simply come up with a bigger boat to manage those different needs seems to me to lack quality critical thinking and an opportunity to really step outside the box. From a values perspective, it shows me right now what you're making most important is efficiency. Money, growth, supply, demand. But what about paying attention to the, all the other things that other people have mentioned, like safety, quality of service delivery, innovation, creativity, the opportunity to really pay attention to what does it mean to make this island sustainable. What you're proposing does not help us do that. Lastly, um, you mentioned your concern is that ultimately other businesses could support the the overflow that happens. That's just fear-based conjecture. You've demonstrated that it takes a lot of work to get any kind of vehicle or vessel out there to support transportation. So I don't believe that that's really gonna happen and I think we're tired of fear-based conjecture to support massive major policy and changes in how we support a whole community. Thank you. Um, 
Hi, my name is James Fleming. Uh, we've been part-time residents here for seven years. No, I don't think they um, uh, Can we flip back to, uh, to an earlier slide? I think it uh, said uh, the board was uh, to represent the uh, residents of the islands. Can you get back to that slide? There's like a fourth or fifth slide. of the inhabitants of the islands comprising the districts and other passengers. Okay, anyway. So uh, the reason that we like to live here is because the island is quiet and it's close to nature and it's, you know, it's just a nice place. But, you know, if you come and you dump thousands of people on the island, it's, you know, it isn't going to be that. We don't, we don't want this place to be a tourist trap. We want to, we want to live here close to nature and have a chance to enjoy it. Um, and yeah, so uh, demand does not have to be met with a supply. If it's a pain to visit here, you know, people are going to be discouraged. So, uh, for that reason, I uh, do oppose the, the uh, proposal to have a much greater capacity. that you might address when you have some comment back to us at the end of this public comment input session. It was very helpful for me to learn some information today and I still feel that there's quite a bit I don't know yet. So while it might seem appealing on certain days or runs to have more vehicles and more passengers accessible for the ferry runs, um, I do hope that many other solutions would be considered for the peak times. Um, scheduling hasn't been discussed, as well as use of other vehicles that are already in the fleet. Um, my friends and neighbors are island business owners, and I want them to be successful. I know that you know the Hannigans and Lisa Lynch and Leslie and Stewart and many others that I'm probably not naming um, also need to be successful in the summertime in order to support the island residents year-round, and we want that. I want that for them as well. Very few people in this audience and on this island have been multi-generational Native Peaks residents from families. We all came here at one time as a tourist and grew to love it and loved, or loved it at first and came to live here because we made a trip, a vacation or a day trip. Um, and so as a board member for the Peak Seven Children's Workshop, I would love to see more families with young children be able to populate the school here so we don't have to worry about pre-K closing or ending and supporting a workshop and daycare on the island. So, you know, in theory, I think it would be a good thing for us to have, um, you know, more year-round rent uh, tenants and renters. My biggest concern and some of the questions I'd like to have answered are around safety. Um, managing passenger offloading and loading in Portland especially with those red barriers that are up, of course, passengers with babies, strollers, dogs, and anyone with mobility issues into the street where cars are loading onto the car ferry and where freight is being dropped off and where other cars are coming through. So an increase to more cars and more passengers, I, I honestly don't know where they would go. Peaks does not have the infrastructure, nor do we have the ability to manage the car ferry line as it is. A police cadet is ineffective in managing the issues and number of people we have and the things that we are experiencing down front. 
and we do not have sufficient police, EMS, and fire coverage. So if you would please talk about um, some ways that that's been considered with increased capacity, um, I would be interested in learning more. At this time, um, I do not support the increase of a ferry to this degree that you have proposed. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kim Morris, and I'm lucky enough to have grown up on Peaks Island, and I've um, been an on and off resident for 30 years, and I would agree with the majority of what people have said that I am against a larger ferry, and I'm just hoping, hoping that all of this information is taken into strong consideration by the board and everyone who's making the decision because people that have lived here for a long amount of time, we spend a lot of our time on these ferries. So I would think that we're almost more than stakeholders. I mean, everyone has their favorite bench, their favorite side, you know? I mean, this boat is very much a part of our everyday life. So I'm just hoping that all of this information is just really listened to. Hello, and thank you for um, coming out and hearing us and providing a place for us to, to, to gather. Um, I would like to, this is a question you may not, oh, I'm sorry, Lisa Peniel there, Lisa Peniel there. I live on Upper A Street, I live year round, I work on the island, I have a business. I raised my daughter here. Um, I've been on the island over 12 years, going on somewhere, I lost track. Anyway, um, I, I do oppose the 600 passenger ferry. I think that's, I, I, I have to actually just agree with what everybody said, because it, it makes no sense um, to, to build a vessel of this magnitude for you know, two, three months out of the year. There are other, what, what is really lacking from this is a planning process that looks at all of the tools in your toolbox. And the other one really important tool that transit systems all over the country, all over the world have been using is a reservation system. Nobody would and not have to wait until eight o'clock because you've been bumped off by a wedding party. Oh, goodness, sorry, I'm gonna get a little um, intense about this, but the, the whole process, I, I, what, the question that I would like to ask is um, who exactly is on the design committee because it hasn't been made public, and when was the decision to design out a 600 passenger ferry made because that has also not been made public. It appears that it must have happened fairly early in the process without any public input. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks for having us. Split Callow, Peaks Island, resident, business owner. Lot to t like to talk a little bit about your design of the boat. <laughs> I imagine a double-ended boat that's going to take up a lot more draft right at the ramp. There's not a lot of water there. So I, unless you do some emergency dredging, <coughs> to two 
diesel engines running at the top end to make the schedule. Uh, I don't think two boats, two car ferries is sustainable for this business. Two boats are expensive, let alone full. Uh, something's got to be done. You do need 14 vehicles on the boat, whether it's cement mixers, box trucks, semis, you're going to be able to take the 14 vehicles, not eight, not four. Uh, that's the biggest problem with getting the crowds off the island, is we can't get the, the full load of vehicles on that boat that we have now. So maybe three lines or two wider lines. I know the federal regulations are going to be kicking in where you need to have more space. I don't know how that design is going to fit that dock. You need a little bit more beam. Maybe moving some stuff around. I don't know. Uh, just some concerns there, and we definitely need a bigger boat. Thanks. Hi, my name is Candace Myers. Uh, I'm a resident of Peeps Island. I was born as a summer resident. Now I'm a year-round resident. And I just wanted to bring up um, just two points that were earlier made earlier that I just want to tie them together. Um, someone had mentioned, something that I had noticed as well, that everyone who is selling tickets has been promoting Peaks Island. They're, when they come up there and they say, which, which island should I go to? They're always told Peaks Island. And I know that because I know people who sell tickets. And they tell me that that's what they were told to say. The other thing is, the other comment that Chuck Radius made, and that was about the board. And the board is made up primarily of people really from down the bay, or at least at least half of them. And they're gonna be making a decision about our boat. And you think about it, tie those two together. <laughs> Thanks. My name is Kelly Gillis, and I'm uh, fifth generation on the island, and now my grandchild is seventh generation. I grew up down here, and I've seen all the different phases of Casco Bay lines when the car ferry was over yonder, and you know it was separate from everything else. Um, I'm against the bigger boat um, for the simple fact that you know if you build it, they will come. Uh, the other gentleman that said, you know, we should have two boats um, for the fact that there's just such a small amount of time that you need a huge ferry. Um, and if I were to go for a bigger boat, it would need to be, you know, have a priority type situation. I just think the more people will come and, you know, 90 year old grandmothers will have to you know, wait in the heat along with pregnant mothers and little crying babies and, you know, they live here and I don't know, I guess if you can figure that out, then I'll go along with your little plan. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jody Halliday and I'm a resident here of Peaks Island and the first thing I want to do is to reiterate Margaret's point that we do not want to be in an adversarial relationship with the Casco Bay Lines. We need you. You are a lifeline to America, we jokingly refer to it. And you need us, because Peaks Island provides approximately two thirds of the revenue that supports uh, the Casco Bay Lines. So we do not want to be in an adversarial relationship with you. What we would like is to hear more respect for the opinions that have been voiced here today. Um, on one of your slides, you indicated that the Vessel Advisory Committee was appointed by the board president. <clears throat> the Vessel Advisory Committee has been tasked to prepare a recommended vessel design for the board. So we know that the board is kind of saying, Let's, we'll let the Vessel Advisory Committee do their thing, and then they're going to report back to us. <clears throat> In a recent conversation with the president of the board, of the a board president, when I asked him for his feelings about the new boat, he said, and I quote, 90% of the people he had talked with wanted a larger boat, and that we needed a larger boat. 
And I think, as the statistics will tell us today, 90% of the people <laughs> are perhaps not in favor of a larger boat. <clears throat> so that response does not strike many of us as being flexible and being open-minded to the constituents that the board president was elected to serve. Um, my question is, I have two questions. My first question is, Lisa Penalve has asked to join the Vessel Advisory Committee. Is she welcome to do so? My second question is, while it appears that there is ample representation for a larger vote on this Vessel Advisory Committee, it is not clear that smaller vote advocates have a seat at that table. What assurances can you give us that all sides of this issue will be given equal weight? The last thing I want to point out is your, I want to uh, under, underscore again your mission statement, and your mission statement as posted reads so that, so that you are to provide sufficient, dependable, reliable service in a safe and secure manner as affordably as possible so as to preserve our year-round island communities. That's what your mission statement says. And then your vision statement goes on to say that the district will also offer tour and charter services for the purposes of supporting and not detracting from the core passengers and freight functions. That's what your vision statement says. So I would just hope that you would take all of you for today into consideration and that you would make sure that our best advisory committee represents all sides of the story. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kathy Newell and I'm a year-round resident. I've been for a long time. I just want to remind people that there are people that are not at this meeting. I actually lived here. We didn't have to go to a meeting to live on this island. <laughs> and that there is a silent majority out there that um, is not looking to explain to everybody what their feelings are. I'm glad to get information from anybody that wants to give it to me. I don't feel the need to um, explain my position, and I don't want this to turn into another neighbor against neighbor thing, I think that whether you are far against this this vote, that people need to remember to be polite to everyone. Thank you. Hi, my name is Steve Hemos. I'm a resident of Fern Pell, yeah. 25 years, something like that. Um, and I, uh, I, I feel that the question size of the vote is premature. And my reasoning for that is that we have not had anything really to do with the process. I went to several of the meetings that you had on your little chart of where they were. Uh, there were no minutes taken. They were informal. Uh, and I remember the one about capacity. Uh, the scheduling was embarrassing in, in its lack of focus and the lack of information presented other than a, a schedule, for instance. Uh, so I would, I would like to think of this meeting that we're having today is the way the process should work. Mm -hmm. This is the way you gather information. And once you have the information, uh, not the data on the statistics, you've done a good job maybe on that, I don't know, I haven't seen any of the background information, how it was gathered, but I, Let's assume that it was honestly uh, put up there. Um, but this is the way you gather information from the community that is being served. And I'd like to recommend two things. The minutes are kept of the public meetings. We have not received, and we've asked and asked and asked.
for volunteer organizations on the island. So we hear a lot of things about uh, size of boat, capacity, infrastructure, both here and in Portland. And I have come to the conclusion that we do need a larger boat. My suggestion is, as Hank said, 400 to 600, blocking off the other 200 when not needed. But I have come across several times when I could not get a car on the island because in the wintertime, when the car ferry was loaded, uh, just recently, uh, three huge trucks uh, preceded me on the island, on the boat, and uh, we had to uh, make other arrangements. Uh, so I do not buy this theory that uh, only in the summertime is a larger boat needed. I don't think that uh, the number of passengers has been examined enough, but I do know that in the summertime, you do need the 400 pound, 400, 400 person capacity. And several other issues. From what I understand from Hank's pitch, it will not cost much more to run this boat based on fuel. And if we only have 400 passengers, not any more crew. The crews have been fantastic, by the way. I want to say, say one thing about, uh, I don't want to give Nick too much credit, but the, the, uh, the crews are fantastic when you need them, especially off season. They do an amazing job in the summer. And, uh, a new boat is something I'm sure they would want. It's just the capacity, and I think 16 cars and 400 plus the 200 will make the difference. Just don't make it higher than three levels. Thank you. Um, my name is John Whitman. Uh, since 1976, I've ridden the boat six days a week, 50 weeks a year. And at this point, I've spent a year of my life on the boat. <laughs> I, uh, that doesn't mean my opinion's worth any more than somebody who's only spent a year on the island. Uh, but uh, I'll be brief because so much has already been said that I agree with. Um, I think, Nick, that uh, I'm really glad you're having this meeting. I almost didn't come because I figured, well, the down the bay people will end up outvoting the even if the Peaks Island members of the board were all unanimous, down the bay will rule as usual, so it's a waste of my time to be here. And maybe that's right, but I hope not. Uh, I really do. Uh, we don't need another boat. Uh, I am a little disappointed that the board has kind of gone with the idea that there's a sort of inevitable growth that's going to happen. We've got to plan 40 years, so we take percent or five percent or whatever multiplied by 40 if you did that you'd have a boat that you know could take 2,000 people so, so the logic that is not there uh, if you really wanted to do that Hank you'd say you know seven percent five percent pick your percent and multiply it out over 40 years you know the Queen Mary coming out here um, they, the board has got to accept the, the fact that in a way you have created the demand you have driven the demand Another thing, and I'll be brief because I, I don't want to take a lot of time, but your constituency is the people who live on the islands. You know, the day tripper who doesn't get to go on the boat or go to Reggae Sunday and has to wait another boat, it doesn't matter to him. And if it gets too crowded, he'll go somewhere else. But we live here. This is our home. Christ, the boat itself is my home. <laughs> we don't need another boat. We don't want it. And you have the brain power to, to deal with this in a more subtle way than just saying, demand curve going up, 600 passenger boat, 20 visit vehicles, or whatever it turns out to be. I think you need to go back and, and really think about it for the sake of the people who are your constituents. Thanks. Could I look at that money chart again? I'm Chris Hoppen, I'm a resident for 20 years, and like some people in the room, I've been on operations committees, and I was on the, on the board, no, the other one, with the peak. 
That one right there. This is the part of this whole discussion that I think really needs a lot of focus. First of all, this is a Public Utilities Commission sponsored utility. The ferry line is not a business. It's run by or all those other organizations. And I support what Howard just said. We need, obviously we need to replace the boat, and we need one at least 400 passengers and more cars because of all the problems we're seeing year-round. And I want to go back to what Hank mentioned and remind everyone that the summer peak business that we get lets us operate the bay lines all year round. We need that revenue in the summer. And a little bit of history, if you want the good old days, go back to the 1890s when we were the Coney Island of Maine and had 10,000 people here on a Sunday. All right? This is who we are. And it's the bay line's job to provide the service to the passengers and the, the uh, freight and the vehicles. That's a utility. That's what it's supposed to do. And if it doesn't do it, in the summer, other companies will come in and steal that money, and we will be in trouble the other nine months of the year as an island and as a community. So keep in mind the way the, the budget works. And when I was on the board 10 years ago, was when we finally figured out a way to flatten out the borrowing. And those guys on the other board who were with me at the time remember that. We, we, how long has it been since we've had a price increase on our tickets? Years. 10 years at least. And the reason is partially because of this offset tourist business that we're getting that we must handle as a utility. Let's not lose sight of that. What should we need? A, we need a new boat. What the size is, we're working through that. I'm sure with all this input, you're hearing a lot, and perhaps some compromise between 400 and 600 might be the result of these meetings. But we definitely need a new boat, and we need to make sure that we're protecting our revenue that we get in the summer to support year-round islanders all year round. Thank you. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, hey, hey. hey. Hold it. There's somebody behind you. Uh, there's a line. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. My name is Linda Capone, and I'm a year-round resident of the island. Um, my, my big, my, there are two things I've heard this morning that have really resonated with me. Um, the first is that the solutions that were that this was the easiest solution to the problem, build a bigger boat. What I haven't heard is the investigation of other solutions. Um, I've requested on my um, question sheet that I will leave, um, I wanna understand better how, how you are regulated and managed. I don't understand what the Public Utilities Commission's role in this. I don't understand. I'm, and so I'm, I'm left not knowing who's got my back. I don't know. And I want to know. Because those are the people I need to talk to. Because right now, I'm uncertain. I, I hear that you're taking care of one aspect of what I need, which is affordable, ongoing ferry service. And thank you, I appreciate that. But what I don't understand is how you are able to propose a huge increase when we already have problems with our infrastructure on this island. I don't understand what the role of the city of Portland is in this. How can they not protect us and protect all the people coming here from the hazards of coming here? Where's the traffic study? How do I know that you've studied this question? All I know is you've decided to drop off the people. I don't know what you've decided, how, you, how you've determined what the impact of dropping off those people is, and what would need to be done to accommodate the safety and health of everyone who's here during July and August. 
Uh, as someone referenced, I mean, the, our, our cadet person, it's, it's a waste. And I, I, I'm just, I'm very concerned about that. And again, um, this, you have a yeoman's job, but we have to have, we, need some, we do need some creativity here. We need some wider thinking. This has been a, a narrow answer to a problem that needs much broader thinking. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for being out here. I'm Jean Hoffman, 19-year resident of Peaks, and I've built a couple of very successful businesses in Portland. And I'm going to speak to economics. There have been a lot of good points made. In fact, all the points made are good and valuable. And I really appreciate you coming out and listening to this input. There needs to be more of this. The Casco Bay Lines, can you go to slide, slide five? It's slide uh, 12, please. That's 11. Next one. There you go. Uh, this is puzzling. Current law. So I have a copy of the statute here. Um, State of Maine, an act to create the Casco Island, Casco Bay Island Transit District. I have this language from the enabling legislation, but it doesn't say what you have up here. What it says is, for public purposes in the interests of public health, safety, comfort, and convenience of the inhabitants of the islands comprising the district. The wording of the statute ends after district, and those bolded words aren't here in the statute. Others have done homework and read the mission, and it's to serve the islanders. We're all here as Peaks Islanders, but the mission is to serve all of the islands. We understand a little bit more today about the economics, and those of you who's done, who've done past martyred service on the board understand even more. And if there are downturns in ridership in the summer, it makes it much more risky, particularly for the Down Bay Islands, which are dependent on peaks. By constructing the dialogue here to exclude creative solutions, and there's a clear path based on the data from your own consultant survey about frequency of ridership there is a clear path to significant ticket price differentials, not based on specialness or anything illegal, but based on frequency of ridership. By managing demand, which you as a utility serving the Islanders should in fact be doing,
as a governor to keep them in balance. Um, many would say that the tourist component is already negatively affecting our quality of life. If you increase the size of the ferry, we will see an increase in day trippers, and it will have a negative impact on our quality of life. Thank you. I'm Cynthia Pelican, and I have lived on the island for 19 years. coming in the winter. All of the building on the island goes on in the winter. So these people want to get here. And if it costs you more money to have things done on the island, realize that when a vendor comes here or mechanical people come here, and they have to wait for more than one ferry to get back, that's money that we're paying. That's the cost to us to have those people come here. And already there are some people that say they don't want to come out to the island. Have you had trouble getting workers out here? That's, you know, it's cost, it's cost. And it's cost to us. So I think we have to think about that. I'm not in favor of bringing 600 people on the boat. Of course not, we can't afford it. We, we don't have the structure for it. But the infrastructure problem is something the PIC ought to be looking into and working with the city. And that's something that everyone here is forgetting. That's not the Bay Lines issue. That's our issue. And if we are upset with these infrastructure, we need to do something about it. We can't ask the ferry lines to do it for us. Thank you. focus, as I recall, was uh, that um, it would be able to handle pretty much any size vehicle. And um, there, was, there was no real process or concern about <clears throat> how it would impact the island. Uh, there was no comprehensive plan. There was a, a widening um, because there were concerns about pedestrians, so they had to widen the south side excuse me, of Well Street to accommodate a small, narrow sidewalk that, you know, the gradient is, uh, is difficult at best. And, and they had to um, replace or replenish or add a muscle bed down east in order to get that sidewalk. And that was more the focus of the process than what anybody has spoke about today in terms of how it might impact the island. And all, one of the things that I can, I hope to share because of my tenure and long time here on the island 
is that the Mashigan, the Mashigan II, um, in my opinion, had the most significant change to the island in my lifetime. And there was little to no process or concern how it would impact. It was more about trucks and vehicles and making money. Um, and then when the Mashagon was built, I, I was riding it for one of the first times and, and in a car and there were two average sized cars and there was a gentleman that wanted to get out to go to the bathroom and we were looking at one another and saying, and he said, well, what if we go down? And I said, you know, we're supposed to stay in our vehicle. Um, and then, you know, they decided, well, the captain can't see out over the bridge, so they had to send it back to great cost to raise the bridge. And so you're talking about this design process. And to be honest, I don't have a lot of faith in it. <laughs> more than anything else is just the desire to um, have this question asked from a much bigger perspective and instead of saying okay here's the problem what's the easy solution to say uh, how can we look at this in a, in a context of, of the whole community and actually instead of solving the problem um, benefiting the community benefiting the business owners um, maintaining balance you know making sure things happen safely and efficiently um, to, to just really broaden the vision from solving a problem to uh, actually creating good. Good morning. Lisa Lynch, Peaks Cafe, as all of you. Um, so I generally get the privilege of making sure that there are no fights, cuts in the car ferry line. And, uh, I also get tickets because if I have to stop and bring my freight in or take my trash away, I pay the way to the car ferry line. However, I don't have designated spots in front of me because I didn't want to interfere with it. Anyways, so let's just go through a typical day very quickly. A July day, it's Saturday, it's 5 o'clock in the morning and the car ferry line is already almost to the post office because everybody wants to get their car off the island just as quickly as they can. Personally, when we came, when I was a little kid, we put the shape. The, the city does it, it's vandalism, it's whatever. We need more communication and this is not about, I'm not, I love you guys, you guys do a great job. But if we can somehow make better communication, I think we can make it better for everybody on the island that has to endure these folks. You know, it is public roads, you cannot ride your bikes in the middle of the road. Let's come up with something that maybe the Peaks Island Council in conjunction with Casco Bay Live to give some more information to people when they're coming over here, because that's part of it. They have no idea. Where do I buy a ticket to get back? I'm going to start selling them. They'll be Commemorative on the bottom. We'll find a good 
good charity. <laughs> you know, I think that communication is really what we're all talking about here, and I do think we need more. We need more um, vehicle passenger space. I don't know about. But we, if we could also be assured that on Saturdays or Sundays when we know that the car ferry line is now at plants or is heading to the library, if we could have some assurance that we might be able to have plants ferry come over and remove a large bulk. I know that there's a cost in that, but we're not talking about having a new boat for another two years. Yeah. So that's super important because the last thing you want is <coughs> people do come here, they do provide us economy whether we like it or not. I like it. But, um, and I like providing a year-round service for everybody that's on the island. Um, but if we can just find a way to make certain that their vacation doesn't become the horrible experience because of the car ferry line. And at the, end of the, at, at the end of their trip, that's where they're at. They're waiting four and five hours. And they don't know. They don't understand that's what's going to happen. So maybe Peak Town Council can be in conjunction and they can work together to figure out a way to be informed people better. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Is there anyone who hasn't commented at all who would like to come up? We still have a little bit more time for first comments. Okay, seeing none, I invite anyone else who has already made a comment. We'll still have the, the three minute timing. Um, thank you guys for coming out and to listen, listening so patiently to all of us. Right now, Hank, you've gotten input today. You're going to have a transcript made, which takes time and a lot of work. And yet you have a vote scheduled of the board on the 28th, which is five days from now. And I'm wondering, is it possible for you to postpone that vote, that vote until you've been able to absorb this information and study it? And I don't think board members can do that in the next five days. I'm still Margaret Kelsey. And um, so I've been coming to the island for over 40 years. I started as a summer resident. And what's funny, what I was sitting here remembering is the time when my mom, the rebel had come in and Nick was actually the captain. And like every summer day when there's a lot of traffic, she wanted to get off and I had already gotten on the boat. And right at that time, um, there was a period of where, based on the tide, the boat was level, the small little deck was level with where somebody could jump in through the window. And the whistle had already been called and no more passengers, but my mom was like, I gotta get on that boat. And so she jumped in through the window. And who looks over? But Nick. And I don't know if you remember this, but of course, my mother was escorted off the boat. And we all laughed, we kind of cheered. Why? Because we could resonate with the pain of a woman who wanted to make the boat the demand, and it dawned on me, we're still solving the same problem with the same thinking. Now all we've done is we're at this new place. Do we get a bigger boat? Because we need more people trying to make the boat. I feel the pain of the people who are definitely in need of car service, and I think the increase in the commercial traffic is one of the biggest things that also needs to be addressed. I don't think just getting a bigger boat is going to address that problem. I would love to see us explore other avenues that make it possible for the, not for the need of a bigger boat to help transport more passenger vehicles to support the elderly or anyone else who needs to get here by car, but to look at what can we do to really support the commercial businesses who do make this, business, this island sustainable also. And to, again, I, at the end of the day, rely on some value that helps us think outside of the box and not continue to apply the same thinking that have been used for the last 40 years, so that at the end of the day, we're not gonna have somebody trying to jump through a window and get hurt. I'm still Arthur Fink. Can we go to the very first slide, a picture of just a boat? Yeah. Early on in my education, I was taught to read the fine print. 
Can anybody read the fine print on that boat, the, the name? It says Aka Cisco 3. I think we need, we don't need a bigger boat, but we do need trust. And seeing that picture of a larger boat called Aka Cisco 3 makes me worry and reinforces my fear when, that I had when I came in here that a decision has already been made that we are going through this exercise and sharing our heartfelt and reasonable and often very carefully researched views, but the process is going to still move with that larger vote. And I would love to have some assurance that the strength of the views that have been expressed at this meeting, which was not regularly scheduled, it was called when it was clear that there was an uprising of popular opinion, that that will be heard and felt. And yes, the process may be disrupted politely but really while this whole question is viewed in a broader context. Thank you. Carol Eisenberg again, and I wanted to address a couple of quick points. One is that there's been a lot of specious logic non-logic applied to the presentations that we've heard and the information that's been put out. And one of them is this idea that someone's going to swoop in and snatch up the profitable summer business as happened in the past. That was part of your presentation, Hank. And I've been looking at the statute uh, that governs that online. And what I've learned is that in order for someone to petition the PUC to, bring, to offer uh, scheduled service, they have to demonstrate an inadequacy, and that the PUC, in deciding whether or not to grant it after giving Casco Bay Lines, Casco Bay Island Transit District 60 days to cure whatever deficiency was identified, the commission may not grant a certificate for scheduled passenger freight or vehicle transportation service that is likely to have a significant adverse impact on the rates that must be charged by the Casco Bay Island Transit District, the capability of the district to sell or repay bonds, the short-term or long-term financial viability of the district, or the ability of the district to retain a reasonable level of cross-subsidization, taking into consideration the full range of services provided by the district and the requirement that the district provide and maintain reasonable and adequate service rates and schedules to the islands of Casco Bay as required by Section 5103. So as you can see, this, this fear tactic is not not in fact accurate because the PUC is charged with maintaining our ability to have long-term service and keep it viable. So that is something that I think is indicative of the kind of logic we've been hearing all along. We also saw a chart showing the, um, thank you, the profitability in the summer, and I believe that that chart, I can be corrected if I'm wrong, was for the district as a whole. It doesn't sort out the revenue in Peaks Island. My understanding, and I think it's correct, is that Peaks Island runs in the black in the summer, and in the red in the winter, but all of the other islands run in the red all year round. And the board is dominated by the representatives from down the bay. And I think what's being asked of us with this proposal for this terrible vote is that we on Peaks Island subsidize their quality of life by sacrificing our own. And that is not appropriate. vessel size that we have, um, the Bay Lines has shown that it is financially sustainable, just the way it is. Um, and so the problem then becomes how to handle the demand. And unfortunately, using the vessel, the mega ferry as we are starting to call it, um, the only thing that does is move the congestion problem in Portland right over to Peaks Island where it's out of sight. And that doesn't really work for those of us on Peaks Island. Um, this really does require a much broader planning process and thought about moderating the flow of, of tourists during those three months. And because we are already seeing that the level of 
traffic that you have been able to generate is already sustainable, then, then saying we need more and more and more amounts to a form of, of, of greed. And, and we're, we're just an island. We're never going to get bigger. In fact, we're going to get smaller because sea levels are rising. So um, this can't be a linear growth model. And, and that's what, it, it needs to be sustainable. And that's a big thing that's missing here because I believe you guys are working on straight lines going up. And, and that can't happen. It's got to level off. And, and yet you can still be sustainable and maintain prices. Thank you very much. We actually do have time for one more. Oh, right. Uh, Mark Green, a 20 year resident, full time resident. There's a graph you showed of uh, ridership as a function of time. So. Yeah. The only thing I'd say, because a lot of the arguments we've heard uh, in favor of a larger vote uh, has to do with ridership and, and the growth in the future. And you say you had a trend line there, 4% growth. And, and that's being driven uh, because you put it through five data points, which is just an arbitrary or an arbitrary uh, regression. If you, if you looked at just the last three years, I, I, maybe I'm wrong. I don't see 4% growth, and, and um, so I, I, I'm just uh, I'm just wondering why you chose to put the regression through three five lines and not three, or because you can you can make that slope anything you want depending on what data you want to include. That's all. Thank you. Well, thank you. I know it's not easy to stand up and voice your opinions and questions, and I know that the staff and board value your opinions. At this point, we're going to transition for the last 15 minutes or so, and the Castle Bay Line staff are going to respond to um, as many of the questions that came up as they can within that allotted period, and then we will end right at 12.30 to allow um, time to transition to the, the ferry if you are heading off island. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass this mic and we'll just ask that all of you repeat the question um, that you're going to answer before Can we make providing. Sure the question that was asked regarding the decision that's scheduled for March 28th, whether or not the decision on the design capacity will be postponed. Can we make that one of the questions for a shorter, a shorter could you hear that question? So that, yes, okay, yes, they will. Thank you. So since this slide is up, uh, I'll be straight, I'm still Hank Berg, General Manager Casco Bayons. Um, since this slide is up and there's a question about this slide, we didn't, you, we, we sh to your point, Mark, exactly, I don't know where you are. Yeah, to your point exactly, we showed these three different trends just to show there are different ways to look at it. When we do projections, we actually pick the more conservative growth of the less than 2%. But it's, we thought it was important to show the most recent trends. Um, so, so for questions that we can easily answer here, uh, and we'll take the less time, I'm gonna go through at least what I think I captured, and we'll do, as we said before, we'll answer uh, the rest online. Uh, so uh, one of them was about, uh, I'll go right to uh, Randy's question about, uh, uh, it was kind of two parts. Um, I don't remember who asked it exactly, but it got involved at the board meeting on Thursday. One was about the concern of the transcript. We will have that transcript available on Monday, and it will be posted online and sent to the board. So uh, it will be well ahead of the board meeting. It's not my decision to postpone any um, vote of the board. The board can do that during their discussion if they feel that they have enough material or not based on what we give them. And uh, there'll be public feedback at that meeting also and uh, for any other input that they may get. Uh, I believe it was asked when the last fare was increased and that was uh, around 10 years ago, actually before I came on board. question, sort of indirect question of why 
We're at a Mashagon replacement meeting and the Ocasisco is on the cover slide. I thought this is actually our new, uh, our rebrand. And uh, I thought you guys would be pleased that we're pushing down big. <laughs> um, question of, uh, uh, let's see, uh, the, uh, how we're regulated by the PUC. It, there's, it's, it's, it's a lot, uh, but I'll try to uh, share a few things, and there's certainly more, and you can certainly go online and check it out. But the PUC, um, regulates us as a whole. Uh, however, they're probably most involved with fare, any fare increase, and we have to demonstrate that we followed a specific process uh, set up by the PUC. Um, in terms of other factions, factions of the uh, district, if, uh, if someone feels that we are not fulfilling the regulations or the law, they can uh, get a petition with 50 signatures, I believe, and post it to the PUC, and the PUC will look at it and determine whether there's any validity to that. And um, they also allow um, the, the fact that uh, if someone wants to um, perform services that aren't allowed by the law or go against the law, they allow private entities to submit that application and they will make a, a ruling on whether they'll, they'll allow that or not. Um, we have different interpretations of uh, of that specific law, that's okay. Uh, the question was who was on the design committee? We answered that, I can't remember who asked it. Uh, we'll be glad to post it and on, the, on the website. Can't you answer it now? Uh, I don't have the list in front of me. It's, it's pretty short. It will it'll be posted on the website. I just don't want to make a mistake. Um, question was, how do we know where Cas Casco Bay Line stands financially? The annual audit by an independent accountant is uh, posted on the website once it, the board uh, reviews that. We uh, post informal uh, financial statements monthly after the uh, board reviews them. So you can go to the website to find out. Uh, the uh, questions about the design of the new vessel, I want to make it really clear that the design is not complete. We're 20% into the preliminary design process. No decision has been made. And the board has not directed us or made any decision in terms of design or construction of the new vessel. Uh, there were several questions, many questions about the uh, infrastructure. Uh, that's not easy. Uh, question to answer, but I can share with you that uh, on the peaks, it's, it's, we, we are responsible for the vessel. The main department of transportation uh, owns the, the pier, the wharf, the transfer bridge, and then after that, the city is responsible for. So uh, in terms of infrastructure, it's all of us there. In terms of the mainland, at Portland, it's, uh, it's Casco Bay Lines, and we're um, planning to improve that for what little real estate we have, we're planning to make improvements with that. We have funding to do a, a, a renovation project, our phase two renovation project, and we're actually going to be submitting a competitive grant to try to take that even further for further improvements on that. Um, are there any other ones that you guys have that might be easily answered? Excuse me, I had a question about the break-even point for the current vessel in terms of ridership and uh, how many trips per year under the break-even point sure, for the current I, I vessel. I couldn't possibly answer that today. We have to go back and look at that. Did you, did you write it down? Or we have it? Okay. Oh, okay. Good.
can't answer easily today will be posted on the website. That's not one that I carry around in my back pocket. Excuse me, Nick. I have one simple question that I didn't hear an answer to yet. Is where is the money coming from to pay for this vote? How is it how is it paid for and whose money is it? There's how much of it is grant money and how much of it is Sure. Um, that actually wasn't a question that was in the queue, but I'd be more than glad to answer that. Um, the, for the total $11.2 million, I just want to make sure I have it right here. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I think I'm, it's more specific than that, right? You want to know the sources of the. Sorry. Most of the funding is, um, I, can't, I can't find the exact one. Oh, I'm sorry, the question was, uh, how is the funding for the new ferry? Where, where is it, the funding for the new ferry coming from? And it's, um, it's uh, coming from multiple sources. The, the most of the funding, 85% uh, of the funding is coming from the federal government in terms of from uh, the Federal Transit Administration, from two different sources of funding that they have. The, uh, the state is providing funding, uh, is this, is, okay, the state's providing seven, seven, uh, seven. So, so what happens is because the grant, the federal grant is uh, um, funding 85% of this project, we have to find a local source of 15%. Half of that 15% was provided for from the main department of transportation. And the rest of the, the funding is supplied for from the city and Casco Bay lines. The city, we, through our lease through the garage, actually, we get funding into this. advisory composition was defined by the board during the strategic planning session and the slots are already filled but I'll be glad to talk with the board president um, the best advisory committee uh, meetings are open meetings however um, they were I believe they were for the public to, to be there and to listen and have comment at the beginning but to let them listen to the process during the, during the conversation they will be, yes, they have been and they will be posted. There, I, we don't, there's not one planned until we get further on in the design and we know a more specific date. The question is when public comment will be uh, uh, had for the, for the vessel capacity discussion. That will happen when we get to that business agenda item and it will happen prior to the board taking it under um, advisement or taking, having their discussion. So they listen to the public first and they'll have their discussion and then there'll be a vote. Uh, the meeting starts at 7.45 a.m. Thursday morning. There's several items, other business items prior to this one. I, I really don't know how long those will take. of the, um, the survey done by an entity not Casco Bay Lines. Uh, the other survey is part will be shared with the board. And that, that's actually, that survey was more of a, for uh, the project, the beginning for the project as a whole, which included schedule and fleet and, and vessel. But you've had so that actually, since 2017, and it was very clear in terms of the district with the
letter from the Peace Island Council that highlights the need for infrastructure improvements that are associated with the demand being created. We're just about to wrap up, but I do want to say um, none of the questions that are being said, not on the microphone, are, are being, they can be heard as part of the transcript. Um, and just to be recognized, please, before speaking, I think we just have another minute or so before we're going to wrap up. And I'm going to defer to Hank whether um, he wants to talk about next steps or we'll take um, one more question, if that's really all we have time for. I just wondered if the board members were here, um, would they stand up so they can be recognized? Sure. Um, it's being asked if the board members that are here will stand up. So there are. There are five. Um, six. I'm missing someone. I forgot you, Patrick. <laughs> okay, uh, just I want to make sure everyone was aware of the uh, next steps. The, the presentation again will be available on the website. Answers to the questions as soon as we can get them on. I'm going to provide a transcript on the website. Uh, our goal is on Monday. Uh, and uh, any feedback after today will be shared with the board following their March 28th meeting. We really appreciate everyone coming out and sharing their comments. It was very valuable to hear everything. And I would just ask that uh, two things. One, if you didn't sign the sign in, please sign in the sign in uh, sheet. And if you could take two minutes just to put your chair away. In the back, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much.